Guys, I think we're forgetting what makes football fun. What makes football fun is that there isn't one way to do this. The greatest show on turf Rams and the 2000 Ravens won the Super Bowl in back-to-back -back years, and they are very literally polar opposites of each other. That is why football is awesome. You can't go all the way analytics. That gets you fired like Brandon Staley. You can't go stick in the mud, only I test coach stuck in your ways. That gets you fired like literally insert any coach from the last decade that got fired here. It's about balance. It's so many different ways to do this. I'm not gonna use the skin of cat analogy because that's nasty, but you know what I mean. And the fact that we're all attracted to different things. Some people love running quarterbacks, some people don't. Some people like possession receivers. Some people like receivers like Tyreek Hill that run their ass off. Some people like a big bruiser running back. Some people like a Darren Sproles as shifty guys. That's what makes this fun. The fact that everyone can like different things. You can tune into a football game and tune into whatever you want and find what you want. With that said, let's get into this power ranking list because my word is law. <laughs> All right, first two out. First up, we got the Indianapolis Colts, who got a very good win against the Pittsburgh Steelers in a last drive where they bullied the Steelers in a turn of events I did not see coming. The last drive, they went like 13 or 14 straight run plays to close out that game, and that was nuts. Nothing pissed Steelers fans off more than watching them get bullied at the end of the game. Losing is one thing. Getting bullied is a whole nother thing. And now they're in a three-way tie for the division lead with the Jaguars and Texans. More on that later. Next first team out, the Los Angeles Rams. I really wanted to put them in the top 10, but I, I couldn't justify it. I couldn't. Outside of whoever loses the NFC East, they're my favorite wildcard team in the NFC right now. I'm banking on Sean McVay being one of the three to five best coaches in the league. Matt Stafford looks like Matt Stafford again. If you really go back and watch the film from that Ravens game, it'll make your jaw drop. He was throwing dime after dime that game. I really like what I'm seeing from the Rams so far. It looks like they're starting to click and get it together at the right time. They have a very young roster, and it looks like they're starting to piece it together now. So they're going to be fun to watch for the rest of the season. All right, actual list. Future Kev that is editing this. Give me my graphic. Thank you, sir. Number 10, I got the Buffalo Bills. They are playing like one of the three best teams in football right now. So why are they at 10? Thanks for asking. They're still outside of the playoff picture. They're the nine seed right now. And I can't justify putting you in the top five or three if the season ended today and you're not in the playoffs. And they would need a lot to happen that's not in their control for them to make it. They could win every game for the rest of the season and still not make it. However, if things do go their way, there's an outside chance they could end up with the one seed crazy enough. A team that fired their offense coordinator not too long ago could end up with the one seed in the AFC. Crazy. Number nine, we got the Jaguars and oh boy, how the mighty have fallen. Three game losing streak. I went back and watched the film. They left nine to 21 points on the field that night. And the one touchdown they did get wasn't because they put a magical drive together. It was because the Ravens had a blown coverage and your man was butt naked wide open and caught the ball. Defensive side of the ball, they got like a 50% pressure rate or some crazy shit. But Lamar. Mm -mm, you're not it. Lamar. You can you can get to him. Good luck getting him down, but you can get to him. It's it's not looking great for the Jaguars right now, man. Number eight, I got the Kansas City Chiefs. I know that sounds low, and they dropped after winning a game. However, if you wanted to convince somebody like me that this team's gonna turn it around and make a Super Bowl run, you're supposed to be the supposed to be tanking Patriots team by way more than 10 points. And you know what the definition of insanity is? Watching Kadarius Tony make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake and going out there in the press conferences and in your podcast and saying, yeah, you know, he's our brother. We're going to stand behind him and he's going to play a key part of his team. We're going to keep feeding him and me and expecting a different result and hoping he can get together. My brothers in Christ, it is week 16. It is not going to happen. But the problem is we don't know what the alternatives are. Sky Moore just got hurt, so he might miss the next game. Rasheed Rice is still a rookie. He's not ready to be a featured receiver. And every team in the league knows to double Travis Kelsey at this point because God knows what else they're going to be able to do at receiver. I felt Mahomes' little rant on the bench in my soul. Anyone who's ever had to do a group project by themselves felt that in their soul. At number seven, we got the Cleveland Browns, who coincidentally still have the same record as the Chiefs. Now, Joe Flacco giving a ball up that many times, not sustainable. He's going to have to get that together. I know they're making headlines about him. Oh, Flacco's back. Eh, keep the ball, Joe. Stop turning the ball over. However, the defense is still as good as ever. Joe Flacco is playing good enough to to keep the defense motivated and that's really all that matters justin fields had to be a literal superhero for the bears to move the ball 
at all. So that's a win in of itself. Shout out to the Browns defense. At number six, I got the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles losses are as follows. Zach Wilson at home. The Niners ass kicking at home. The Cowboys ass kicking in Dallas. And now losing to Drew Locke in Seattle versus a Seattle defense that was missing its three best DBs not named Jordan Love or Julian Love, whatever my man name is. I still have faith that they're going to get it together. I trust the talent. I trust Sirianni. But, ah, man, it's getting bad in Philly, man. Like, the fans are getting restless. However, the rest of their schedule includes uh, Linguini Sanity Tommy DeVito and their old defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon and the Arizona Cardinals. They can still finish the season 13-3. and three. After all this, they can end up 13-3 and three and still win the division and end up with the two seed. So they'll be fine. At number five, we got the Dallas Cowboys. And the most concerning part of that Cowboys loss is the run game was abysmal. They got rid of Zeke in the offseason. We know that was a cap casualty that had nothing to do with his actual play. They just weren't trying to pay him all that money in the offseason. Understand that. They expect the Tony Powell to be the feature back. Did not happen. They tried early in the season. It turned to Dak having his superstar run for the season. I didn't know that was out of necessity. The Buffalo Bills are only the 17th ranked run defense. They're very literally mid, middle of the pack. And the Cowboys went out there and rushed for 89 yards. Granted, some of that is because they fell behind so early that they had to throw for the rest of the game. But still, for a playoff run that looks like it's going to be mostly on the road if they don't win that division, man, they're going to have to figure out some type of run game to supplement this. As good as Dak's playing, if the game plan is Dak Prescott's going to go throw the ball 45, 50 times and we're going to win this game, they're going to go home early and Mike McCarthy's going to be looking for a new job in the fall. Number four, I got the Detroit Lions. Now, I think I've shitted on the Lions every single one of these lists I pointed out. However, I'm here to give them some credit, specifically GM Brad Holmes, who's also the executive vice president and is also a brother. I'm old enough to remember when they said the Lions had the worst draft class possibly ever and definitely in this year. I'm going to read you what their first four picks were. Jameer Gibbs, Jack Campbell, Sam Laporta, and Brian Branch. It is one thing to get four regular starters in one draft to contribute at all in their career. It is another thing to grab three studs in a starter as rookies. And we were critiquing their offensive line, silly me, as the guy that loves talking about O-line, I somehow kept forgetting that Frank Ragnow, what their center wasn't playing. Centers are very important, by the way. They make all the line calls and the blitzes and make sure everyone gets set up. Frank Ragnall's back. Magically, they can run the football again. Funny how that works. Number three, we got the Miami Dolphins. Now, usually we do the, who have they beaten? Oh, they beat another nobody, but we're not doing that this week. No Tyreek Hill, no problem. 30 points against a good Jets defense. They broke their will. And speaking of breaking will, they also broke Zach Wilson. Knocked him out the game for, they said, at least five to six different injuries that Zach Wilson may or may not have had as to why he wasn't in the game. Y'all have fun figuring out which one is which. But the Dolphins are going to have a chance to prove it for the rest of the schedule. Their last three games are the Cowboys, Ravens, and Bills in that order. So it's either going to end with them getting the one seed or they're going to end up being a wild card team. And we're going to be able to look at them and say, see, told you so. They can't beat a good team. And now look at them. Number two, we got the Baltimore Ravens and Chris Collinsworth said my Lamar Jackson's thoughts almost perfectly. He said it's hard to make Lamar's MVP case based on statistics. But if you watch the game, you can't argue there's a more valuable player. There's so many Ravens plays that should have been blown dead. Absolutely nothing happened. It's all covered up. The pass game wasn't working at all against the Jaguars. Oh, but Lamar. <laughs> Everyone's strapped up and covered. The blitz is in his face. Doesn't matter. I'm just going to avoid this guy. And I'm going to run for 98 yards today because I can. That's the best part about watching Lamar Jackson play football. I affectionately call it because I can football because that's what he does. Almost every play you watch Lamar Jackson make, it's because I can. The defense went out there and granted, the Jaguars left a lot of points on the table, but their game plan was, look, the Ravens lead the league in sacks, so we're going to throw this ball as quick as we possibly can. And the moment they fell behind and couldn't do that anymore, the Ravens got a strip sack and got the ball back because they were able to play defense the way they regularly play again. That's not a coincidence. And now we are less than a week away from the game we've all been waiting for. The Ravens versus team number one, the San Francisco 49ers. Everyone is healthy. Everyone's ready to go. 
We're all going to abandon our families on Christmas to watch this game. I can't wait. There's nothing new I can say about the 49ers, so there's really no point in me even doing this part about them. But still, oh my God, I can't wait. Jesus Christ.